Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Look At Me Look, where you get to look at me look at YouTube videos. My name is Luca, and the title of today's video is Life Beyond. Chapter 1. Alien Life, Deep Time, and Our Place in Cosmic History. So, uh, this video has actually been recommended to me a while back. Um, I haven't had the chance to watch it yet, but obviously this is a topic that interests me very much. And so without any further ado, let's get it. And this video was made by none other than the amazing Melody Sheep. Uh, I love every single one of those videos uh, that I've watched from Melody Sheep. And I can just tell that this is going to be an amazing one. Here we go. Three, two, one. Both options are equally terrifying. Look at this haunting, listen to this haunting music. In all of time, on all the planets of all the galaxies in space. Man, already have the shivers. Civilizations have risen. Looked into the night. Seen what we see. the questions that we ask. Incredibly powerful question. This music is awesome. Exciting. This is amazingly put together, man. What we see around us is staggering complexity. How is it possible? Living organisms are created by chemistry. We are huge packages of chemicals. Now what are the ideal conditions for chemistry? Well, first, you need energy. But not too much. What you want is just the right amount, and planets, it turns out, are just right, because they're close to stars, but not too close. You also need a great diversity of chemical elements. You need liquid such as water. Now, the, the production quality here is amazing. Why? Well, in gases, atoms move past each other so fast that they can't hitch up. In solids, atoms stuck together. They can't move. In liquids, they can cruise and cuddle and link up to form molecules. Liquid 
water is just so good for getting evolution going. Molecules can dissolve in the water for more complex chains. Now, where do you find such Goldilocks conditions? Well, planets are great. And our early Earth was almost perfect. It was just the right distance from its star to contain huge oceans of liquid water. Goldilocks on. And deep beneath those oceans are cracks in the Earth's crust. Fantastic chemistry began to happen. Atoms combined in all sorts of exotic combinations. Can we just pause the video for a second? So, um, first of all, once again, Melody Sheep makes a masterpiece and I haven't even gone through like a quarter of the video yet and I already know that this is going to be probably one of the best videos I've ever seen. Now, as, as it pertains to uh, the theory of how life emerged, I also agree that it's sort of this emergent property of chemistry scaling up under the right conditions and the geothermal vents of the world in the, in the, you know, in, in the deep waters I think are the right primordial conditions for life to emerge there. There's other theories out there which I don't necessarily subscribe to very much, uh, but I think they're interesting ideas nonetheless, such as panspermia, which is this idea that life uh, was seeded on Earth elsewhere. For example, during the period of the early Earth's uh, heavy bombardment by meteorites, um, some of these meteorites had these um, had the ingredients for life on them that they were carrying with them. For example, if another meteorite hits another planet that has life on it, then the debris field that is jettisoned out at escape velocity from the impact rim uh, may have contained you no know, rocks that had certain bacteria or certain viruses or certain forms of life that were carried across the universe and then, uh, you know, crashed uh, down on Earth way later. So that is another idea as to how life could have emerged on Earth. We don't know for sure, but I think that a f um, I actually, um, um, as it pertains to consciousness, to life, and many other phenomena, um, I think that the idea of emergence is a much more plausible theory um, that um, simpler, um, simpler uh, units behaving under a certain set of laws uh, when you scale this up over time, eventually there is this emergent behavior, emergent property that comes about that has structure uh, from an apparent randomness when you look at it from like a unit level. I think this is probably a far more plausible look at how um, life emerged as well as how consciousness emerged. Um, so I very much agree with what is already presented in this video. have adapted to survive the most hostile conditions. Arid deserts, the frozen Himalayas, in trenches under thousands of tons of pressure in the ocean deeps. In the vacuum of a space simulator, life forms have been flourishing for years. Without One of the reasons they think panspermia is even a 
possible, plausible explanation. Listen to this music, it's amazing. Creates the right mood, I think. Mystery, worry. Very, very quickly, as soon as the Earth cooled off after its formation, we know that life began here. Because it happened quickly here on Earth, we think it's going to happen quickly on other planets as well. I would hope so. Kepler 62F. I know of Kepler 22B, not 62F. Practice 1D. Oh, by the way, uh, let me just pause this video for a second. So, in case you're wondering, I'm from Belgium, and um, the uh, the scientist who discovered uh, the Trappist uh, system, Trappist 1 system as well as all of the planets in their Trappist 1, A, B, C, and D. Uh, he is Belton as well, and if you're wondering why did he name you know, this, all, this uh, solar system a Trappist, uh, Trappist is actually a beer in Belgium, so we Belgians, we like, uh, we like beer very much. I don't know if you know this. And so I just find it uh, delightfully Belgian that uh, a scientist names uh, a solar system that has a tantalizing prospect for whether life exists there because the planets are all in the Goldilocks zone pretty much. I find that wonderful that he decided to name that after beer. That's very, very Belgian. I love that. We know that the galaxy is awash in water. It's awash in organic molecules and complex chemistry. All of the things that we know were necessary for life to begin on this planet are abundance exist everywhere. in abundance throughout the galaxy. Look at those. Did something similar to what happened on our own planet happen on those other planets? It seems inevitable from the Drake equation. That's amazing. A quarter of the old stars. Yep. Fifty billion potential incubators of life. 
Not to mention there are rocky moons. You know. Pandora from uh, Avatar is a moon. Lord have mercy. That's crazy to think. Wow, look at that. That's an extremely important point to dwell on. Each has its own rich history, just as rich as planet Earth's. It's amazing. on Earth. It's crazy. Amazing to think about that. Very true. Yeah, that's true. The moons of Jupiter and Saturn. Subsurface oceans under their icy exteriors. To investigate definitely Enceladus. Titan is all. It's amazing. Look at that. This is exactly what I was thinking. Exomoons. I know of this. The close up shot of something that looks eerily organic, like a worm or a parasite.
discovery of just one bacteria on Mars, or any other body of the solar system, would indicate that the whole chain of evolutions, cosmic, chemical, and biological, is at work everywhere. In that case, the creation of life anywhere in the universe would be more the rule than the exception. Within all of our lifetime, we're going to understand that there is life on other bodies in the solar system. Do you think so? It would be we're amazing. We're going to understand the implications of that for evolution of life here on Earth. We're going to find planets around other stars that we can say we see potential signs of habitability in their atmospheres. all going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah. How exciting is that? We're on the verge of things that people have wondered about for millennia. Are we alone? And here we are on the verge of finding that out. Hmm. This is, I think, a very important question. is nearly 14 billion years old and our galaxy is something like 12 billion years old so there could be life out there that could be dramatically more advanced than the life that we have here on this planet man listen to this music There are merely instruments to explode during supernova and scatter their heavy elements built in the their cores across the, the cosmos. Were hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. All the stuff that makes your life livable, those elements weren't created in the Big Bang. The only place they were created is in the fiery cores of stars. And the only way they could get into your body. Supernova is if the stars were kind enough to explode.
pretty. Only after 15 million years. Oh man. Lord have mercy. It's, yeah, it's dawning on me that this is. A Possibility. Good Lord, good Lord. It's possible. Good Lord Almighty. Oh, my goodness me. That's crazy. I never even consider this, ever. Yeah, well, we haven't, the search field hasn't very been, hasn't been very big, has it? compared to the size of the universe. Yeah. Enrico Fermi first postulated that. Think about how uh, advanced a life form could be if it emerged so early on. Could be. Yeah, that is a possibility. Takes billions of years for signals to reach, and they become very feeble when they are reached across these distances. No. It's amazing to think of that as well. We could be among the first. What responsibility does that give us? You know, how should we carry ourselves? We have the opportunity for us to be that ancient civilization billions of years older than the others. It could be us.
habitable zone is between the star facing side and the opposite one, that ring. That's basically the habitable zone. Well, this sheep has already covered this in all the videos I've seen. Like, good lord. Wait, is that it? Part one, of course. Good grief. It's amazing. It's amazing. So I, I don't really understand why people tend to forget about the possibility that life can emerge on moons, not just on planets. When you look at the Drake equation, like the baseline, like the foundational parameter is number of stars, right? Then there's number of planets uh, in the habitable zone, and then it talks about the possibility of life emerging, you know, on a given planet. But they they don't capture like moons. And even in our own solar system, there's potential candidates for life on moons, like on Enceladus or Europa, or you have these icy moons that are outside the habitable zone. But because of the, the huge cyclical gravitational loads that are exerted on the, the on these planets by their on their on these moons by their host planet, um, this forces the cores of these planets, the whole planets themselves, to contract and expand, contract and expand. This essentially pumps energy into them which causes their uh, their internal um, like um, icy makeup to start melting so on the external side you have this icy crust but beneath it you have these subsurface oceans which have existed for billions of years and many of these have the possibility of having you know external stellar radiation which bombards the surface to actually seep in so there's either cracks or you have these vents or you have these geysers and things like that and this creates a possible um, input output gate uh, into the planet's uh, oceans subsurface oceans where certain kind of so to speak firecrackers can be thrown in just to see what would happen and um, I think that's 
people tend to forget that life can emerge there. Uh, on Titan as well, you have just this thick atmosphere. Um, what's going on there? Obviously, life there, it's, Titan is frigid. It's minus 150 degrees Celsius or something like that. It's really cold. Uh, methane there exists in liquid form, so it's extremely, extremely cold. Uh, but still, you have the possibility of having, um, if you have a case like Titan, which is just a moon that has a very thick atmosphere, right? You could potentially have um, basically a gigantic planet like Jupiter or Saturn placed closer to the uh, in the habitable zone, and, and you shouldn't discount the possibility that 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 is a source of life because it could have its own version of Titan or versions of Titan with thick atmospheres, each of which is rocky, and there you could potentially have life emerging. So uh, when people think about, you know, the majority of the exoplanets that we discover today are either what you call hot Neptunes, or they're just gigantic gas planets, you shouldn't necessarily be afraid by that, obviously because of their size and how they perturb and wiggle the, um, the, the host star as they orbit them, or because of their, their gravitational dance that they're doing or also because of how the degree to which they dip the luminosity of the star when they pass in front of it with respect to our telescopes or our instruments. Um, the bigger the planet is, the more pronounced the signal is going to be. So obviously, you know, the way that this goes about is you have these telescopes scanning the cosmos and across millions of stars, they analyze all these signals. And to the degree that you can have a pronounced signal, that means that you can be much more convinced that, aha, there is an exoplanet orbiting there. Um, so, and uh, one of the reasons why we keep on discovering all these uh, star, uh, planets that are closer to their stars is not because, I think, not because most of these planets are closer to their stars, it's just because the period of time that has gone on since the start of this search hasn't been very long. And time it takes for a planet to orbit its star is a year with respect to is is um uh depending on how far away the planet is it takes longer if it's closer it takes shorter so you can much more quickly confirm whether this dip in luminosity um is uh is actually because of a planet and not because it's like something that passed through once because you have more cycles right uh if you have like 10 years uh, and you can basically confirm 30 times that there was that, that thing, you know for a fact there's a planet. Whereas if it's orbiting very far away, it may take much more than 30 years for it to just, for the signal to come again. So, um, I think that, um, I think that we shouldn't discount gas giants as potential sources of life. They could themselves be, um, they could essentially themselves be their own version of, 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 uh, life systems around which you have these moons that where this stuff exists. So that's one thing. Um, another thing which I was going to say is, um, I think that, this is just my opinion as well, I think that there is a certain, um, I think that this concept of the Goldilocks zone, which normally talks like, applies to a solar system, I think that this applies to a galactic level as well. And the only reason why I'm thinking that is because as you get closer and closer to the galactic core, the galactic center, where there's a concentration of stars which is much closer together, and you have you get closer to the to the supermassive black holes at the st uh, at the center, the ambient level of radiation is much higher. And so, I think that there is an ideal band. Um, if you look at the galaxy from outside, there's probably a band um, along somewhere where life is most, uh, where the possibility of life is much is the most fertile, is where the possibility of having life is is highest, uh, simply because the, it's basically like a Goldilocks zone for stellar radiation and other things like that. And the closer you get to the core, the worse it gets. So I think that there's that to be factored in as well. Um, not necessarily, it doesn't mean that in the core that you can't have life forming. Of course, you know, I'm not an astrophysicist. I just think that uh, if you have like a probability distribution of, of states where uh, 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 life can emerge on planets that exist within that given state, I think that the probability distribution is squashed a bit more 
where the peak resides above the this uh, zone that is Goldilocks in terms of stellar radiation, which is probably like closer to the outer bands, I would say. I mean, we are not necessarily close to the center. We're like on one of the spiraling, on one of the ends of the spiraling arms of the Milky Way galaxy. So I think that's maybe something that we could think. But of course, this is just one of my uh, thoughts about that. Um, and I was very surprised to, I was very surprised to uh, learn about this possibility that, you know, during the early universe when it was too hot versus now when the, uh, the ambient baseline temperature in the vacuum is close to absolute zero, which is too cold. Along that period of time, there was a window where the ambient baseline temperature is, you know, appropriate for life. And it is possible thus to consider, or you can thus consider that life may have emerged then, maybe. Maybe. That's an absolutely fascinating thought to think about. Um, I never considered it ever. Um, yeah, so that's it. I mean, I'm, I heard that there's chapter two as well, so I'm definitely going to be looking into that as well. Um, once again, thank you very much for looking at me look at YouTube videos. My name is Luca, and I'll be seeing you on the next video, so don't forget to subscribe and take care.